How's it going everybody? Chaotic Meatball here and welcome back to the channel. So today we're going to be taking on a hardcore Nuzlocke in Pokemon Omega Ruby with only fairy type Pokemon. I figured this challenge would be pretty cool since the fairy type didn't exist in the original Gen 3 games, so why not give it a try in the remix? Plus, I haven't played these games in over a year, so I figured it was about time I did. The rules are extremely simple. Number one, fainted Pokemon must be permanently boxed. Number two, only the first encounter that's a fairy type in any area can be caught. And number three, all Pokemon must be given a nickname. As for the hardcore rules, you cannot go above the level of the next gym leader or Elite Four's ace, no items in battle, and the game must be played on set battle mode. Relatively simple rules, but definitely a hard challenge. But before we get into it, make sure to bash that like button, subscribe to the channel since two-thirds of my audience isn't subscribed, and I'm really close to getting that 100,000 subscriber plaque. And I really want it. <laughs> now, let's get down to business. So, let's take a look at the Pokemon we can get in the run. Now, you might be seeing Mega Altaria and saying to yourself, Wait, the base form isn't Fairy-type. Well, yes. So I'm not allowed to use a regular Swablu or Altaria in battle, but if it does come out, I must immediately Mega Evolve or switch out as to keep with the rules. I'm not allowed to attack with a regular uh, Altaria, essentially. I probably won't use it anyway, as there's already Megas in the form of Gardevoir and Mawile, but it could come up, so I'm going to preface it here. As for the other four encounters on the top row, these are the only other encounters we can get before the encounter with Groudon. We'll be stuck exclusively with Ralts throughout the first two gyms, but once we hit Mauville City, it should be smooth sailing from there. The other five encounters on the bottom row here are able to be obtained with the Dex Nav exclusively, with the exception being Togepi as it's another egg obtainable in Lava Ridge Town, just like why not. With all that being said, we have essentially 9 encounters to deal with the entirety of this game. Let's see what we can do with it. Starting out, I decided to pick Mudkip as my starter so that I wouldn't have to catch myself an additional HM user later on. Plus, May's not really that big of a deal in terms of battles anyway, with the exception of Route 110, so I'm not worried about what she picks. I take it down, get the Pokedex and Pokeballs, and immediately head on over to Route 102 to grab a male Ralts. Sadly, of course, Gallade isn't part fairy, so we'll have to stay with the Gardevoir evolution, but that is a great starter. Sadly, though, it's only available at level 3 and therefore doesn't have an attacking move until level 4 when it learns Confusion. On my first attempt of this run, I tried my best to drain all 40 power points of Growl so that I'd be able to struggle enough Pokemon down to get it to level 4, but I found it basically impossible to do, as Struggle does one fourth of your max HP any time you attack with it, no matter how much damage it does, and Ralts' attack is absolutely abysmal. I had considered chaining for a Ralts with an attacking move, but that wasn't the first encounter, so I figured that wasn't going to be acceptable, so I just went down and had to start again. This time I wasn't exactly keen on putting up with bull this early on, so I decided that the Nuzlocke doesn't start until I get a fairy type with an attacking move, using Mudkip to switch train my second Ralts to level 4, and depositing Mudkip from there. I named this one Ben 10, no not the alien transforming kid. Today's nickname theme is Cyber Angels, a Yu-Gi-Oh archetype surrounding ritual summoning, and they're all fairy types as well. So I figured it would be a very good fit here. I also made sure to grab a Zigzagoon on Route 101 so that I'd have both the HM users I'll need throughout the run, and proceeded to grind Ralts on its own from there, getting it to level 5 so that I could take down the only required trainer on Route 102 before grabbing some berries. There's a ton of Oran, Chesto, Cherry, Pecha, Citrus, and tons of other berries around this region, and this will definitely be what I use as held items for a good chunk of the run. Anyway, I do the little tutorial with Wally and his Ralts, moving back to Route 102 since there's training that needs to be done pronto. Since I only have one Pokemon to run throughout the first two gyms, I need to make sure that I spend some time Eevee training it to make sure that Ralts can survive through Roxanne's Geodude and Nosepass. My three priorities here were damage output, keeping my speed up through Rock Tomb, and having as much HP as possible to survive attacks. So that's how I handled it. With a mix of Ralts chaining and super training, I did that in order to max out Ralts special attack, while also doing an equal mix of Eevees and speed and HP. Maxing out while also grinding up to level 11 so that Ralts could learn Disarming Voice. This is because there's a required Team Magma Grunt battle in the Petalburg Woods with a level 9 Poochiena, which I wouldn't be able to damage otherwise. 
In return for defeating him, I get the EXP share, which like the last Nuzlocke we did on the channel, I'll have to maneuver around to make sure I don't overlevel anything by accident. Also during the training, I picked up Double Team, which will be my strategy to outlast Roxanne, along with a held Orenberry. So after edging up to the cusp of level 15, it's time to kick her to the curb. She leads with a Geodude, so I go for Ralts, tracing Sturdy as I set up a Double Team. She lands a Rock Tomb for exactly half as my Orenberry procs, so next turn we do the same and she misses. She misses again for the third turn, then shifts to Defense Scroll for a turn before going back to Rock Tomb, hitting one after I set up my sixth Double Team, allowing me to take it out in two Confusions after triggering Sturdy and making her waste a Potion. Second and last out is Nose Pass, so I went for Confusion, doing over half, but Nose Pass outspeeds and lands a Tackle, bringing Ralts down to 7 HP. But it misses next turn as Ralts KOs with Confusion, winning me the fight. Alright, well, I'm very appreciative of that being done on the first try. I was very much not looking forward to possibly having to do all of that super training again, especially since we're going to be doing it for every Pokemon in this run. So there's another required battle against a Team Magma Grunt over in the Rest Turf Tunnel, so I immediately get rid of it with Ralts' disarming voice, letting me rescue Mr. Briny's Wingle and head right on over to Dooford Town. I figured going straight for the gym would be a good idea since Ralts is already really close to the level cap for this section. And after taking out the trainers in there, I edged up just slightly, and it's time to take him out. Brawly leads with Machop, going down to Confusion, as does Makahita. <laughs> well, what did you expect? With two badges in hand, there's still one more problem battle I have to deal with before being able to get a new encounter. See, I can't get into the basement floors of Granite Cave until I get the Mock Bike, so Mawile's off the table until I get to Mawville City. So, you know what that means. After clearing out the trainers on Route 109 and getting through the grunts in Slateport City, it's time for Route 110. I had a bit of an initial scare against this trainer with both a Plusle and Minin, where I managed to survive because Minin decided to use Switcheroo, giving me its own Orenberry and healing me slightly enough while paralyzed in order to survive long enough to KO and live to fight another day. Wish I could have avoided that fight, but nonetheless, I evolved Ralts into Curlia at level 20, and now it's time for the rival fight. This is probably the hardest fight early on, and I'm kind of worried I might not be able to do it, but let's see what we can do. She kicks off with Slugma, so I just jammed six double teams in a row, only taking a single Ember without getting burned before hopping over to Confusion, KOing Slugma in two attacks before Whalmer came out next. Since I have Magical Leaf now, it's a near KO with a critical hit, finishing it next turn and leaving just Grovile. It outspeeds, going for Pursuit and missing as Confusion lands a critical hit, confusing Grovile, but it's able to land a Pursuit next turn for minimal damage as I finish it off with a second Confusion, winning the fight. Thankfully, that was not at all painful. Now to finally get some encounters. I ran through the remainder of the route, only fighting a single additional trainer with a single Abra before getting the Mock Bike from Mawville City, going over to Route 117 to capture Meryl. I name it Edatan, and guess what? We've already won the challenge, since I captured an adamant huge power Meryl. Yeah, we're going to be kicking everyone's ass with this thing from here on out. Huge Power was already amazing when I saw it putting in work during the Black Tube Water Nuzlocke, so I'm excited to see it do the same thing here with even more power behind it, and the Fairy type. Now that that's captured, I went back to Duford and into Granite Cave's second basement floor, but before going after Mawile, I figured Super Training Meryl in Attack and Speed would be a good idea first, taking about an hour and a half on that before hunting for Mawile, finding it on my second encounter, and capturing it in a Great Ball. I named it Takini, and I'm starting to realize that I'm capturing all of my encounters in different Pokeballs, so maybe I'll keep up that theme for the rest of the run. I decided to super train this one in Attack and Defense, since those are its highest stats, and having a bulky Pokemon that can also dish out some good damage will be very appreciated, especially if I decide to use the Mega Evolution in certain battles over Mega Gardevoir. Speaking of Mega Evolutions, I've decided that I'm not allowed to use them in battles that don't have an opposing Mega Evolution Pokemon, so we're going to be very limited on using this. Heading back to Mauville, I wiped out Wally and took on Watson's Gym Trainers, edging my team up before the fight against him. I'm going to be leading with Azumarill, and it's set with Aqua Tail and Rollout for physical moves, so I don't expect this to fail me, especially with the added insurance of a Cherry Berry for Voltorb Static. 
He leads with Magnemite, so I start off with Azumarill's Bubble Beam, getting hit with Thunder Wave as it does over half, healing with that held Cherry Berry and taking it out with a second, leading to Voltorb. Aqua Tail is easily enough to take it down without static activating, leaving just Magneton, and since it doesn't have Sturdy, it also goes down to a single Aqua Tail as well, winning me the fight. Three badges down, five in the league to go, and stuff is starting to feel a bit more comfortable now that I have some more Pokemon to work with. But I can't get careless. If even one Pokemon goes down, I'm going to only be stuck with three Pokemon remaining until I get past Groudon, if I can. Now that we finally have a decently substantial jump in level cap, I'm finally able to be a bit more comfortable fighting optional trainers to gain some extra levels and money and such. Though I didn't fight a boatload of them through here since lord knows I want to exclusively use Azumarill due to the sheer usefulness of its power this early on. Heck, it even gets more useful at level 25 where it learns Play Rough, a 90 power, 90% accurate physical fairy type move that has the chance of lowering the target's attack stat, so I'm definitely in a good position. Traveling through Falarbor Town and onto Route 114, we have that one weird encounter, grabbing Swablu, and I name it Izana, and decide to keep it on the team simply so that it can get EXP off of the EXP share. I didn't even bother super training it yet, since I really don't expect to use it, unless I get really desperate. With that in the bag, I'm able to move into Meteor Falls, rescuing Professor Cosmo from Team Magma and chasing them to Mount Chimney, where we've got a pretty nasty encounter with Maxi for this early in the game. Sure, his whole team is fire types, but seeing a camera up this early on when my Curly and Mawile would basically melt like butter underneath it is quite worrisome. Thank goodness we have Azumarill. He leads with Mightyana, so I decide to lead with Curlia since now it knows Draining Kiss. Plus, I can trace Intimidate, making his Mightyana just that much more useless as I KO with two Draining Kisses, leading to Camerupt. And yeah, there's no way I'm staying in here, so I swapped over to Azumarill, taking an Earth Power for about a third as I outspeed next turn, KOing with Aqua Tail and leaving just Golbat. I figured Rollout would be wise, but I missed getting hit with a wing attack to follow up and procking my Orin Berry, so I swapped from Mawile so that I could intimidate it, walling up but getting confused in the process. It takes three feint attacks to put him down through the confusion and several turns of trying to, winning the fight without any casualties. From here it's a literal hop and skip over to Lava Ridge Town which surprisingly only has one required trainer in the gym, though I did accidentally run into a second one. Not that big of a deal since Curlia learned Calm Mind at level 26. While I'm not confident in using it during this fight, that'll definitely come in handy once it's a Gardevoir. Flannery leads with Slugma, so I of course choose Azumarill, going straight for Defense Curl to set up Rollout so that I could sweep the whole team, since Sunny Day is coming right out, guaranteed. I missed the first one, getting hit with an Overheat that did about a third of damage, but that wasn't a big deal, as next turn I KO'd Slugma, leading to Numil, who was outsped and KO'd as well, leaving just Torkoal to go down to the third hit of Rollout, sealing the deal. Gotta love Defense Curl Rollout Sweeps. It's funny, Defense Curl is actually a broken move with Rollout. I would have never guessed, but here we are. With the fourth badge in tow, there aren't many new areas I can go to for anything that's actually productive, so it's just a quick train up to the level cap for Norman, which is level 30, on as many trainers as possible so that I can get some more money, since I keep having the problem of running out of healing items and repels during my time and routes, so alleviating that was needed. But once all of the trainers are over with, Curlia evolved into Gardevoir just in time, and I'm sitting with a nice team of three for Norman, so I think I'm ready. My strategy here was to use Mawile exclusively as a punching bag, since it of course is a steel type so it resists all of Slaking's stab normal type attacks, but it also has Intimidate, so I sent it out on the first turn of the battle using Crunch as Slaking use Yawn, swapping to Gardevoir on the turn that it's loafing around. Something I also realized here is that I can't exactly use Gardevoir to sweep thanks to Trace taking the Truant ability and giving it to Gardevoir, so I'm gonna have to rely mostly on Azumarill and Mawile to do the heavy lifting. A few swap betweens later and I start going out into Azumarill, going for Aqua Tail and taking it into very low yellow HP, seeing a yawn come out in response. I don't really want Azumarill asleep at all during this battle, so I just did another round of Intimidate as Norman healed up, and since that doesn't eat up the Truant turn in this generation, I went for Rock Smash in the attempt to lower his defense. 
This doesn't work, so I just did it again next turn, yet again not getting any defense drops as Yawn comes out again. So I swap into a Zimmeril on the Loafing turn, using Aqua Tail to take it out and lead into Vigoroth. Since Laking managed to get off a Yawn on Azumarill before going down, I of course swapped into Mawile to shake that Yawn off, getting an Intimidate as well, as he goes for a Retaliate. Boosted by the KO on Slacking, and stacking that with a critical hit, for really minimal damage. Jeez, if <laughs> that didn't do that much, nothing's gonna hurt Mawile. But I figured I'd swap over to Azumarill again just in case, since I'm gonna use that Intimidate strategy again for the second Slaking. Azumarill manages to outspeed and KO with a single Aqua Tail, leaving just the second slacking next turn. We do the routine again, intimidating it once before it lands Chip Away, doing a bit more damage than I expected it to do, but that's fine since I've still got plenty of HP, especially after an Orenberry. But then it starts using Swagger. I don't know why, especially since the AI is clearly seeing the sheer amount of swapping I'm doing, but I'll take a no-risk move instead of something that can land a critical on an accident. On the third attempt of Swagger, Slaking misses on Mawile, so I take the opportunity to go for two Rock Smashes, getting hit with a chip away for a little bit of damage, but finally getting that defense drop. Well shoot, two Crunches should be able to do it from here, and it can't KO from this range even with two criticals, so I just go for them, KOing and winning the fight. I think that's the most strategy I've had to put into any of the fights so far, which makes sense. Slaking is an insane Pokemon that if you don't have a two-turn move like Dig, that keeps you a semi-invulnerable for Slaking's attacking turns, or something like Protect on Pelipper, it's really not gonna go well. Now that I've got the fifth badge though, I'm given access to Surf, so I take my Mudkip out of the PC and head straight for Route 115, where my last pre groudon encounter awaits, that being Jigglypuff. Fortunately, there's a Moonstone in Meteor Falls, but I'm not worried about evolving it for a little while. I name it Vrash, running back over to Mauville City and heading east towards Route 118. Steven takes me on a little journey over to Southern Island, where there's a battle against Magma Abin and Courtney and a Grunt a double battle, but since Steven's on my side during the fight, we immediately wipe them out in a single turn, winning the battle and giving me Latios for free. It's not a fairy type, so I try to put it in the box, but the game forces it into my party. <sighs> making me have to go back to the PC and swap it back out for Swablu, since I still want that EXP to siphon into it. Thank you, game. There's a good number of trainers between here and Fortree City, but the level cap only jumps from 30 to 35, so I'm gonna have to pick my spots wisely, especially since that Magma encounter is in the Weather Institute and there's a few grunts there. I figured I'd also teach Gardevoir Charge Beam over Double Team in preparation, since I really don't want to use cheesy evasion strategies in fights that I can legitimately win and it's definitely going to be helpful with the gym coming up. By the time I got to the Weather Institute, the only one getting close to the level cap was Azumarill at level 34, but I wasn't turning off the EXP share just yet. There's also a very handy vending machine in here, so I can finally have some good healing items at a low cost, since I'm still not very high on money just yet. Admin Tabitha's at the end of it all with a single camera opt, so I bust out Azumarill for one single battle, hitting it with an Aqua Tail to take it out in one shot. This is where I figured I'd turn off the EXP share since I don't want any more going on at Zoomeril, or else things are going to get extremely dicey with Winona, and I don't exactly feel like training up Jigglypuff just yet. Just after the Institute is another battle with Mei though, and she's pretty darn easy. I led with Gardevoir and set up Calm Mind twice, but that's when I realized she's using Clear Smog with her Slugma, so I just shifted to Psychic to take it out, leading to Grovile. For some reason, she's still in Gen 3 mode, going for Pursuit with neutral damage as I go for a Draining Kiss, healing me back up to full as she goes for Leaf Blade. Doing slightly under half as Draining Kiss again heals me up quite a bit, KOing and leaving just Whalmer to fall to a Psychic. See, that's why I told you guys at the beginning of the run that May wasn't gonna matter. The HM user has been much more efficient. She gives me Fly, so I taught that to Swablu, moving into Fortree City. Of course, I can't get into the gym without the Devon scope, so I went to Route 120, grabbing that off of Steven before thinking about held items for Winona. I know I can't use Mega Evolutions since she doesn't have any, but since I'm on the topic, I went over into Verdant Turf Town and grabbed the Mawilelite since I will need it later, heading into the gym from there. I also completely forgot that you can do this puzzle just right and skip every trainer in here. And because I can do that, I'm not about to risk edging up and having to go through this again and risk running into a spinner, so I just went straight into the battle. Winona leads with Swellow, so I go for a Zoomerill, setting up a defense curl as she goes for double team. She only uses it once, shifting over to Aerial Ace as I miss with Rollout, 
but next turn as she uses a second double team, Rollout does manage to land KOing Swellow with Altaria following up. Not sure why she'd send out the Dragon type against the Fairy, but it doesn't matter since Rollout KOs, and then proceeds to do the same thing to Skarmory since it doesn't have Sturdy, leaving just Pelipper to fall to the same fate, winning me the fight. Gotta love Rollout spam, it just works too well. So, now that I've got three-fourths of the badges in hand, I decided to train up Jigglypuff, evolving it with a Moonstone that I got from Meteor Falls and moving through Routes 120 and 121, stopping in Lily Cove to make it a flyable location since our next destination is Mount Pyre. There's not many trainers here, but there is the TM for Shadow Ball, which is going to be super important later on in the run. Edmund Courtney's at the top of the mountain as well, and she only has a single camera up, going down to a single Aqua Tail from Azumarill before I get the blue orb. This opens up the Magma Hideout stuff over in Lily Cove City, but May standing in the way of that goal by accident, so let's get her taken care of. She's finally added a fourth Pokemon to the lineup in Swellow, so I lead with Gardevoir, going for Calm Mind twice as she goes for Double Team and Aerial Ace, not doing too much damage as a second Aerial Ace connects before I fire off a Psychic, KOing and leading to Waylord. I decided to use Draining Kiss instead of Charge Beam here since I wanted to recover my HP for her last two Pokemon, barely missing the KO as she sets up Amnesia, but since she didn't heal, Draining Kiss number two takes it out, with Micargo coming in third and going down to a Psychic. Last out is Sceptile, who uses Detect. I guess it's detecting the inevitable one-shot Psychic it gets next turn and wants to grasp onto life. Sorry, Sceptile, we'll see you after the champion battle. Now that May's out of the way, though, I'm able to head through the Magma Hideout, grabbing the Master Ball, and oddly enough, I think this is the only time it's used in the entire game to my knowledge, and that's a Horde Trainer Battle. This is one of the reasons I trained up Wigglytuff, since I wanted to be sure that I could hit all five of the Poochianas with Disarming Voice, and not have to worry about them whittling me down or lowering my stats a boatload, getting to Courtney at the end. I really wish she'd get a new Pokemon, because it's depressing hitting this camera up with Aqua Tail over and over again, though it does seem she's appearing to go insane after losing so many times. With that, Seafloor Caverns opened up, but I need Dive to get in there, so let's go take on Tate and Liza to get access. The trainers are all Psychic-type users, so Shadow Ball is super useful in here, letting Gardevoir sweep through basically everything in front of her with the exception of a lone Girafferig. And I didn't even bother edging up here since the level cap only goes up by a single level for Wallace, so everything inside from Azumarill is level 44, but that's fine. Tate and Liza only use a Soul Rock and Lunatone, so I decided to use the pair of Azumarill and Mawile, using Aqua Tail to take out Lunatone as Mawile targets Soul Rock with Crunch, doing a little bit over half. It sets up Sunny Day, but that isn't going to do enough to prevent Azumarill's second Aqua Tail from KOing, winning me my seventh badge. Kinda wish they went with the Emerald version of their team, since it at least had Zatu and Claydol as additional Pokémon, since the 7th Gym Leader should not only have two Pokémon, especially when it's a double battle situation that can lead to a two-on-one scenario on the first turn. One more Gym Badge to go, but we've got a ton to do with just a single level available in our level cap. First things first, I made sure to clear out the C4 Cavern just up to Maxi, but I don't feel comfortable fighting him just yet. See, I can't get access to the Gardevoirite until after I beat Groudon, and Maxi uses a Mega Camera up in this battle. I'm also not about to send out Mawile against a Fire and Ground type, so I think it's about time I bust out Mega Altaria, delaying the evolution until the level cap of level 46 just so I could get Moonblast for this fight. Maxi leads with a Mighty Anna, so I immediately Mega Evolve since, uh, it's not Fairy type yet. Now that it is, I fire off Moonblast to KO, leading to Weezing. He's got two poison types on his team, which could be a detriment to me, but Dragon Pulse is enough to KO Weezing on its own. Third out is Crobat, who doesn't go down to a single Dragon Pulse, getting off a Mean Look and Poison Fang, badly poisoning Mega Altaria before going down to another Dragon Pulse, leaving just Camerupt. It Mega Evolves and uses Curse as I use Dragon Pulse for a bit over half, KOing next turn and winning the fight, though now Altaria's over the level cap and can't be used for the rest of the section. Not to worry though, as Wallace doesn't even use Omega, so we weren't going to use her anyway. Also, gotta appreciate how exact the EXP was for Altaria to remain under the level cap while also getting Moonblast. I'm surprised that math worked out so perfectly. With this done, Maxi still awakens Groudon, despite the fact that he lost. If I were to be the playable character, I would have round kicked him down into the lava and let the Red Orb burn along with him. Sadly, they're over in the Cave of Origin, 
And oh lord, Primal Groudon is not a fun battle. See, it has the ability Desolate Land, something that means I can't use Water-type moves under, so Azumarill's barely going to be useful here. In fact, I gave it Bulldoze over to Fence Curl just so that I'd have a super effective attack, just in case. I also gave Mawile a Shooka Berry that I got from Route 123 earlier, which reduces the power of a super effective ground type attack, which Groudon has two of rather than the one fire type attack in Lava Plume. I also gave Azumarill a Mago Berry so that it could heal up some HP, as this is going to be my swap fodder since I'm going to be using Intimidate strats to make sure that Groudon can't take out my entire team. After all, once this battle's over, five new encounters open up, so I can lose literally everything except for one party member and still be fine. I led with Mawile to get that minus one attack immediately, swapping into Azumarill to tank an Earthquake on half health, with the Mago Berry restoring enough to do so again, taking an Earthquake with Mawile as Azumarill takes another Earthquake at minus two, not coming back in after that since it's at pretty low HP. So, I get Groudon to minus 3 attack as Mawile finally gets hit with a Lava Plume, leading to my first casualty of the run. No matter, I just went into Wigglytuff and went for round, hitting it once as Wigglytuff took an Earthquake, but for some reason Groudon decides to use Rest after this, letting me hit 3 more rounds to get it into Red HP before Groudon took out Wigglytuff with Lava Plume, letting me send in Gardevoir to finish it off with Psychic, taking a Lava Plume in the process. Alright, well, I kept the exact two members that I wanted to, so I'm pretty damn happy about that. Now that the Hoenn region's been saved, though, I'm able to finally get those encounters. We've got the ability to soar as well, thanks to the Eon Flute, which means making the rounds for these encounters is much easier. First up, Lava Ridge Town, I can get the egg that contains Togepi, but we'll be waiting to hatch that until I get everything else. Second up is Eevee, which I name Dakini Ten since I'm running out of Cyber Angel names and I'm going to the Japanese ones. Third is Clefairy over in Meteor Falls, naming it Vishnu. Fourth is Cottony over in Petalburg Woods, naming it Skanda. And last up is Klefki on Route 113, naming it Nisachia. I probably not going to use Klefki unless I lose something else, so I just hatched Togepi, naming it Izanami, and trained everything else up, including doing secret super training in order to get a shiny stone for Togekiss, sunstone for Whimsicott, and another moonstone for Clefable. Sylveon also had to get into Pokemon Ami in order to be brought up to Two Hearts of Affection and Evolve, and then I went ahead and edged them all up to close to level 47 for the fight against Wallace. I also went around and got a boatload of useful items around the region, including TMs for stuff like Thunderbolt, held items like the Wide Lens, Amulet, Coin, Metronome, etc., berries like Citrus Berries just for generically good held items, and of course the Gardevoirite. So I'll definitely be set for the rest of this challenge. Wallace leads off with a Love Disc, shoutouts to my first ever solo challenge that I did on this channel with it, as I lead with Gardevoir, setting up two Calm Minds and using a Held Person Berry to break out of Sweet Kiss, KOing next turn with Thunderbolt as Milotic comes out second. I tried going for Psychic here for some reason, taking a Critical Hydro Pump for around 70% damage as I didn't KO, but since Milotic was in the red though, he healed up, allowing me to fire off a one-shot Thunderbolt and lead into Whiskash. This does go down to a single Psychic, thankfully, leading to both of his other Pokemon in Celio and Seeking to fall to one Thunderbolt each, winning me the fight. This was a bit of a stressful one, but I'm damn sure happy that nothing's gone down out of this wonderfully designed team, and they should be going into the battle with Wally as well as the Elite Four with some very diverse subtypes. Heck, we've got Grass, Water, Psychic, Flying, and two pure fairies. It's pretty cool, actually. Not to mention, using Pokemon introduced after Gen 3 like Togekiss, Sylveon, and Whimsicott is exactly what I was attempting to encapsulate with this challenge, showing the sheer difference that one extra type makes to the remakes of Hoenn. Now that I've got access to Waterfall though, I immediately threw that onto Azumarill, finally giving me a 100% accurate physical water type move. Fortunately, I didn't have any problems with Aqua Tail that much during this run, but I'm very thankful to finally get rid of it, just in case it would have costed me something in the future. But all that's left is Victory Road and half a dozen tough battles, especially since I implemented level caps for all of the members of the Elite Four to make this a little bit more fair. First up is Wally at the end of the road, complete with that epic theme that makes me get goosebumps every time I hear it. 
Since he's got a Mega, I threw the Gardevoir right on and went straight in. Mega evolving and firing off three Calm Minds through Altaria's Safeguard, Cotton Guard, and Aerial Ace, taking minimal damage as I fired off Dazzling Gleam for the one-shot, leading to Magneton. It has Sturdy, but it doesn't matter as I don't get paralyzed off of Discharge, KOing with two Psychics and leading into Roselia. Not sure why they didn't have this or Magneton be evolved for this fight, but either way, it goes down to a Psychic, leaving just Delcaddy and Gallade. He goes for the former, going down to Psychic, as does his Mega Gallade, winning me the fight. Sorry, buddy, but it's a little bit poetic that Gardevoir, the original Pokemon that Wally has in the Gen 3 games, takes down his new ace. Kinda feels like retribution for abandoning her. With that somewhat weird realization in hand, though, it's time for the League, or would be. There's still a little bit of prep to do. First up is collecting all of the rare candies around the region. I already got the one that's in Shoal Cave when I got the Shell Bell, but the rest of the candies are free for the taking, getting me up to 14 of them before training up the party to level 52 in Victory Road. See, I don't want to edge because of that adjusting level cap throughout the entire league, going up one level starting at level 52 for each member up until Steven, where it jumps from 55 to 59, hence why we got the rare candies to make sure that it remains as fair as possible. Do you guys think I'll win, or will I need another attempt? Leave a comment down below, and if you think I'll win, how many Pokemon do you think will go down during the league? Well, let's see. So, first up is Sydney, and he really doesn't have much that makes me worry, especially since they're all dark types, as they're all weak to the fairy type then. So, I just led off with Sylveon and swept his whole team, taking out his Mightyena, Sharpedo, Shiftry, Absol, and Cacturin, all with a single Moonblast apiece, winning the battle and moving on to Phoebe. Sylveon is once again the choice for this fight, as I made sure to give it a Person Berry to get through Dusclops' Confuse Ray, getting off a single Calm Mind before sweeping her team with Shadow Ball taking out Dusclops, Bayonet number 1, and Bayonet number 2 with it before Sableye comes out fourth. I shift over to Moonblast as it lands a fake out for minimal damage, leaving just her Dustmore to go down to one more Shadow Ball, giving me the second victory. I'm feeling pretty good about those easy victories, but I don't think Glacia is going to be nearly as easy. The closest thing I have to being able to sweep her is Azumarill's Rollout, and that hinges on a 90% accurate move. This then made me debate between three different held items, the Metronome, Shell Bell, or Wide Lens, since the Metronome would mean that all five of her team members would go down to one rollout apiece, assuming I started with a different attack on her first Glalie. Shell Bell would ensure that Azumarill doesn't go down because it would just replenish a bit of HP every time it dealt a full bar of damage with rollout, but it's not really the biggest problem, so I threw this out first, leaving just the Wide Lens. I decided to go with this though, since it boosts rollout's accuracy by quite a bit and makes the strategy much more consistent, so let's get in there. Glacial leads with Glalie, so I go for Waterfall, doing around 80% damage as she sets up Light Screen, which unfortunately leads to a full restore. I was hoping that it wasn't going to do that much, so that I could just use one rollout apiece on her team, but that's fine as Glalie goes down to two rollouts, with her Ace Wall Rain coming out second. I was worried that this wasn't even going to KO on the third attack, but the third hit of rollout does have enough power behind it to KO, leaving just three more Pokemon. Our first Frostlass comes out next, outspeeding and setting up hail as rollout takes it out, with the second Frostlass following suit. Unfortunately though, since hail's already set up, it uses Confuse Ray outspeeding, making Zumeril hit itself. This breaks the rollout chain, but that's fine as I just KO'd next turn with Waterfall through Confusion, taking a Blizzard in the process that, along with Hail, takes Azumarill down to just over half HP, leaving just Glacia's second Glalie. I still figured Waterfall was the play though, hitting it for over half and hoping for a flinch, but it doesn't happen, letting her land a freeze dry for super effective damage, leaving Azumarill at 15 HP after Hail. I considered swapping, but I do outspeed and I have a pretty high likelihood of getting out of confusion this turn, so I just went for Waterfall. Sadly, Azumarill doesn't snap out. But it doesn't hit itself either, baby, landing one last Waterfall to seal the deal. That was ballsy to say the least, but I definitely was better off swapping to something like Sylveon there. But hey, what is a Nuzlocke without the funny risk of uh, plays that might end a run if it goes really poorly? With stupidity behind us, there's only two more battles to handle, and I'm pretty sure you guys already know how the next one's gonna be handled. It's time once again for a Sylveon sweep, this time setting up Calm Mind twice and taking an Aerial Ace before firing off five Moonblasts in order to take out Drake's Altaria, 
Flygon number one, Flygon number two, Kingdra, and oh boy, Salamence actually outsped and flinched Sylveon with said head, but that is not good. Well, fortunately, it can't damage me with any stab dragon type attacks, so I swapped into Clefable, my most expendable mon, taking a Thunderfang in a Zen headbutt, doing a wee bit over half as Moonblast KOs Salamence, leaving one final showdown. Steven's level cap is level 59, so of course I went ahead and rare candied my most valuable team members, those being Sylveon, Gardevoir, and Azumarill, leaving two for Clefable to get it to level 57, and one for Togekiss to get it to level 56. I left Whimsicott at level 54 since I have a plan with it which involves sacking it because I don't really care. Also, since Steven has his Mega Metagross, I threw that Gardevoirite on one more time as well as a few other items, giving the Spooky Plate to Sylveon, the Metronome to Azumarill for Waterfall, and the Rocky Helmet on Clefable. This should be enough to take on Steven, though there were two other things to worry about. Both his Skarmory and Agron have Sturdy, meaning a sweep with Mega Gardevoir isn't going to be instantly possible, so I'll have to work around those first before I can sweep his other four Pokémon. Kicking off our final battle is his lead Skarmory against my Whimsicott, setting up Tailwind as he hits me with Steel Wing for a bit over half. So I U-turn out next turn to disable Sturdy as Clefable comes in. This lets me go for Sing, missing the first time as he sets up one layer of spikes, but hitting it the second time, giving me the switch to Gardevoir in order to both Mega Evolve and set up a Calm Mind. Unfortunately, his slate doesn't last long enough, landing a nasty Steel Wing for a ton of damage as Thunderbolt KOs next turn, leading to his second sturdy Pokemon in Aggron. Now that I've successfully baited it out though, I swapped into Togekiss to make it the ultimate sacrifice, using Yawn and going down so that I could go into Whimsicott hitting a Razor Leaf and disabling Sturdy with it before going down, and in between turns, Yawn manages to put it to sleep as Mega Gardevoir comes in. Spikes damages it a little bit, but I'm able to get off two Calm Minds before shifting to Thunderbolt, getting a one-shot and leading to Kray Dilly. The sweep begins as Psychic takes out both Kray Dilly and Armaldo, with Dazzling Gleam taking out Claydol and leaving just his Metagross. I was hoping that plus two Thunderbolt would be enough to KO his Mega, but it's just shy, leaving him in the red as he KOs with Meteor Mash. This forces him into healing though, so I'm able to go into Azumarill and go for Waterfall, doing around a third with it as he goes for Giga Impact, but doing barely not enough to KO as I hit Waterfall, but then he has a recharge turn, allowing me to hit one last Waterfall and get the KO, the win, and the championship. <sighs> Holy crap, that was a battle. That was good Unfortunately, losing half of my team wasn't good but we've made it to the end on attempt number two and I couldn't be happier. I don't think I could have played this run much better though, other than, you know, doing calculations for stuff, which by the way, I didn't do a single calc for this entire run. I love the difficulty of trying these without having some external calculator cheating thing, making things go super slow. But with that, that's our third Nuzlocke in the books. But I'd like to leave the door open to you guys. What Nuzlocke would you like to see me try in the future? Preferably ones that haven't been done on YouTube before, since I don't really like doing videos that already exist. I'll pick one from the comments, not for the next Nuzlocke, as that's already in the middle of production, but for the one after that. I'll be looking forward to it! If you guys enjoyed this video, make sure to like, comment, subscribe, click the bell, tell a friend, and don't spend more than a minute doing that since if you are, you're taking too long. I want to give a huge shout out to my $10 and above patrons, Justin Dimmenstein, Zachary Kiever, Aiden Brannon, Andy Garber, David Dunn, Kyle Campbell, Landon, Michael Evans, Phoenix Fire, and Zeno. Thank you guys so much for your support. If you'd like to support the channel as well, you can head over to my Patreon page, link in the description, where you can get access to stuff like videos early, an exclusive role in my Discord server, link also in the description, challenge requests, and much more. I really appreciate you guys taking the time out of your day to watch this, and I'll see you guys next time with another challenge. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I'll see you next time. And yes, I swept my after the credits with Sylveon and Moonplast. Okay, bye!